So I'm saying my, in my new model, instead of buying or building in silo mode and then implementing and supporting the whole life cycle in, si in silo mode, how about the whole life cycle now becomes shared? Why not? We could share the entire life cycle, and I'm going to show you that this is not just theory. Some already do it today, even with ERP. Some of this is already done today. So then I'm saying instead of all that entire life cycle in silo mode, how about we take the entire life cycle and we share it in an open source type fashion. And if we do that, we're going to create an ecosystem where not only government benefits, but private sector benefits, and also we're going to need some NGOs in here, some of these consortiums and foundations, some of those folks that are going to help us get organized, much like the Apache Foundation or the Mozilla Foundation. You know, some of these larger projects cannot exist without some central point of coordination. So that's what this says now, that we could create our software and share it, or we could do a leveraged buy. What's a leveraged buy? The NGO buys an ERP, not each individual state or locality, the NGO buys it and gets the rights to give away, uh, sell basically, licenses to other institutions. That's a leveraged buy. I get a great, great deal, a great price, and now it's one, one acquisition that gets shared by many. It's being already done today. And then how about this thing of shared implementation, shared services? Why do we all need to manage and maintain and patch and version those pieces of software that probably others could do better than we could do it. And some of that is already done today. So that's basically the model I'm going to. I'm going to create a few more slides and then hopefully we're going to have a great discussion and free as in beer cities at the end. Okay, now here's a life cycle the way I look at it. The components are the build and improve. This is if you're going to build our own software, that's this part here. Build and improve. This says leverage buy, so the NGO buys it and shares it. And then here is shared services. So let's look at the subcomponents of all of this. When you share software, you, you're going to build it and share it collaboratively. Well, then you're going to use some sort of a license of that software that is either open source or could be, could be community source. Does not need to be GPL. Uh, I prefer GPL when I can handle it. Sometimes, to really to get buy-in into a community, you might need community source, not fully, fully open source. Okay, but you still get the, the advantage. And Sakai is a great example of a community source project. Then the technology could be open source, but could be proprietary as well. And most people think of open source as it's got to be written in PHP. And I think they're missing the point. That's really not the key, what language you write the application in. The key is that you share it. And there are examples today of proprietary technology developed applications that are shared as open source or community source. Okay, so let's come on the other side over here. Leverage buy. So leverage buy would be the model that the NGO buys the license from SAP, Oracle, Lawson, and there are examples today of Lawson having implemented this in Texas. So the NGO buys a license. It's a proprietary license. The, sh the cost of that is shared. Okay? And the consortium, the NGO, owns the rights to that license. The technology is most often proprietary, but it could be open source. Doesn't really matter. You see how things kind of intermingle, and it doesn't need, need to be black or white. It's not all open source, or it's all proprietary. The real issue is we are sharing in the cost of this thing. So it doesn't matter how you buy it, one way or the other, whatever meets your needs. But then when we come to shared implementation and services is where we save even more. If you look at the cost of an ERP project, just recently I had a conversation with somebody from Pennsylvania. And the state of Pennsylvania implemented ERP. They spent something like $30 million in license fees and approximately $90 million in implementation fees. So I think this is pretty normal for an ERP project that 80%, 70 to 80% of the cost is in implementation. So if you can save on that implementation cost by doing some sort of a shared model, there's a lot of value there. 
And again, there is examples right now in Texas, this has been done with Lawson software. And I'm having conversations with my Secretary of Technology of Virginia, with other vendors, to try to come, come, come on board and understand that this really would work for the vendor and it works very well for us as well. So shared implementation, you, we, we explained that. We're talking then about software as a service, where I don't need to run that ERP in my shop, that's not important. What's important is that it's run effectively somewhere, where I have good service level agreements and I can trust that they know how to maintain that stuff. So we're looking at things like software as a service, on demand, shared hosting, and all this, I'm really describing to you something that already exists today. The consortium, in the case of uh, you know, sh shared hosting, uh, either the consortium could host that software and, 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 and do the maintenance, or the private sector could. It all depends on economics. In the case of the Texas ERP, the consortium does that service. Okay, the only piece of Lawson in that implementation was the shared implementation. And after that, the NGO runs it, and it's a shared cost model. How about on the, uh, on the community IP side, which is very important? Best practices and configuration settings of the ERP are being shared so that if my organization would be interested, for example, to join the Texas Collaborative, we could do it. And we're going to say, let's use the best practices from Texas on configuration settings and cut our implementation cost in half. So that we don't, we don't start from an ERP that looks like manufacturing, we start from an ERP that looks like government, and I'm just gonna do the tweaks to make it work for Virginia. That's much simpler, less effort than configuring it from the scratch. So you see how uh, open source has a role throughout this life cycle. And then this is the ecosystem I'm talking about, and uh, I encourage a few vendors to come and listen and take good notes because I really think there's a business model, business value in it for them. What I'm showing here is state and local governments sharing. And the three arrows going up, this is a funding model. That they are providing funding in a shared cost type, type fashion. Okay, again, back to the Texas ERP, it was $8 million and it was shared, that, uh, the implementation of that, uh, that loss in ERP was shared amongst those three localities that participated. That, that's these three arrows, who provides the funding. Where does the funding go? It goes to service provider. Service provider provides consulting, support, implementation, hosting, on-demand, uh, software as a service. In case of Texas, they chose not to go with loss in providing this, but rather the NGO. See, the NGO, can provide some of the same services. So it depends where that service is, is done by. Problem, the, the point is that everybody benefits in the ecosystem. So what I have here, I'm showing three lines. One is of funding. The other one is coordination and benefits. Important line is benefits first. Everybody must benefit in our ecosystem to, to survive. In order for it to be vibrant and keep on growing, you have to have a strong benefits line. And it's clear how government benefits, got to make sure that the private sector also benefits. They have to get their profit uh, needs met. And, and even the central government might benefit. I mean, if you think about basically reducing the cost of government, it might even have uh, you know, long-reaching implications of you know, consistency in government, homeland security, and so on. We even look at in certain, for certain projects for central government to provide grants. And that's why you see that red line coming from central government as central government might fund some projects. We have an example of a police records management system that was funded by Department of Justice, open source, written in Java, being rolled out in Texas. For some reason, Texas is very active in, in this kind of projects. So that's the key here that everybody in this ecosystem benefits. And Another very important point is coordination. In order for collaboratives like this to work, you have to have a good way of coordinating this community and keep it together. Or else things just fall apart and, and, and the members just start drifting. Okay, now here's this consortium uh, issue. We, you know, I discussed it uh, a few times. This NGO is key to creating this kind of community. And there's opportunity for vendors to provide services, I feel, to the NGO to make this work. 
Of course, the opportunity for the, for the vendors is over here on the service side, to provide the service. There's also opportunity for the software vendor. I'm thinking about Oracle, SAP, if this was an ERP, for example, they would be interested in jump-starting such communities themselves. Why? Many localities cannot afford SAP or Oracle, for example. It's too expensive. Well, if this was, the software vendor was able to provide some value into this shared repository here under some terms that is called community IP, open source, community source. I'm not talking about the software itself. I'm talking about the business rules, configuration settings that makes that software run. If that software vendor is able to provide some sort of a value into that repository, then the champions down here could start this collaborative and then over time more and more join and the collaborative grows. So you look at the uh, um, Texas model, they have three localities and uh, they have discussions now with the fourth one and the fifth one and it's just gonna grow and it's gonna grow beyond Texas because they are, they're not limiting this to uh, their geographic area. Okay, so the consortium is very important. It also creates that legal entity, that one place where the vendor, that software vendor or the service provider can have contract with. The NGO, rather than having contact with this variable number of localities and states that join the consortium. There was a question here, Bernard. Did a particular municipality or a particular municipality or, or whatever set up an NGO on which on behalf of that one plus any future ones negotiated a contract with Lawson in this example and sort of said, you're going to have at least this size deal, but you could potentially have these many more deals, and the deal that you give to this first one that's a real deal, everybody who might come in asynchronously later gets the same deal, and Lawson sort of signed up for that? And, and if so, how did they convince Lawson that that was a great idea to do? Okay, well, first of all, with, uh, with the taxes, it was uh, uh, three cities, Arlington, Grand Prairie, and one more that I can't remember right now. Uh, Arlington is about close to 400,000 in population, and the other one 200,000, and the last one 100,000. They decided together to form this consortium. They already had these are neighbor cities around Dallas, Texas. They were already had an NGO that was serving their needs for other things other than software, just as a you know a collaborative basically for no, normal community type things. And part of of that. Uh, organization was basically dedicated to provide this loss and configuration implementation and support so they did not really start the new NGO they found one that met their needs already had jurisdiction basically over that uh, that region uh, why did Lawson do this well they had got eight million dollars and every time a new state or locality will join there will be additional consulting the only thing is that Instead of each locality doing four or five million in consulting with them, they're gonna do maybe one and a half to two because we're gonna start from a base that is shared. So in the end, I, I really feel that Lawson does not uh, lose anything. Okay, they will continue, and, and this is just such an attractive model that chances are they will sell more licenses and they will sell more service using this model. Another example I have is Texas. Texas did a taxation system in a similar model. model. In that case, one locality started, Wake County. They went to their NGO of choice that was, had jurisdiction over taxation in North Carolina, and, and, and they hold the license and they, they pro 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 provide the service. So in each case, you have to kind of pick an existing NGO that is already vested, has a vested interest in, in supporting that, that uh, uh, region. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Two years, maybe three years ago, I heard a Wired editor from Minnesota, or at least who spoke about using Minnesota's um, co-op laws, cooperative laws that the, the dairy farmers, the cheese makers or whatever had formed <laughs> hundreds of years ago, and using that to their advantage. Do you have any examples of using co-op, co forming a cooperative uh, for this purpose? I'm really not sure what a cooperative is and how is it different from an NGO, but I... I it is an NGO, but it's a, it's a special, there's a lot of special laws that are in place to benefit that specific state or that particular state. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure 
You know, I'm so sorry, I just know nothing about it. You got a good question and I had a bad answer, so give him another CD. I don't know the answer. Okay, more questions, more, more hands? Okay. Okay, so uh, how about the role of open source? And I, I briefly mentioned this, that you, you can see open source kind of has a role throughout this life cycle. This is the clear role that we understand when we build things using open source. Then, then you understand the role of open source. I believe that a much more important even role is not just that you use PHP to build your application or Python or Java, but that you're sharing your application. That is the key, okay? So that's this part of the open source. Even with a leveraged buy, there are a number of commercial products available built with open source te technology. So that's another role of it. But I think that really the key, another key part is this, is this community IP where we're sharing best practices, sharing configurations, and cutting our implementation costs, cutting our support costs. And then in this model, comes back to this, this, to this warehouse where we are sharing the goods. And it's not only about software. Okay, so I mentioned a lot of these things as, and now I'm gonna give you examples. Coming back to the model, I'm put, I, I've put a few of the um, collaboratives that already exist on the chart for you and see if you have any interest in either joining some of these things or, more likely, you might want to call them to say, how have you done it? Because I want to start my own collaborative. So here are the examples that I know about. Washington State has two initiatives, one on permits and one on GIS, and these are regional implementations, shared. Okay, shared everything. This is the shared life cycle model. That's why they're down here. Washington is shared everything. The code is shared, implementation is shared, and the support is shared. Then you have the North Carolina taxation, which is this Wake County started project. Seven counties in North Carolina are collaborating on the same one piece of software, but they have not yet evolved to the point of sharing the implementation and services part. So each county, each city, still sets up their own instance of the same taxation software. Okay, so I think that's an opportunity that they have to do something different. The Sakai project is a very successful collaborative in, uh, in uh, universities. Not sure where the number is with the Sakai, but it's a large application. Uh, it had a budget of four million when it started uh, as a grant. Uh, I think about 150 or so implementations and I think approximately 100 contributors to the project. So this is probably, if you want to look at how do they organize, how is community source being managed here, that's a great, great place to, to look. OpenRMS is this uh, records management system for police. Started with a uh, grant from the Department of Justice, is built in Java, uh, and it's shared as free open source, community source, more, more or less. It's not a source for it's fresh meat, I download the police records management system. It's a community source. And then OpenEGov is a project that my organization is working on. We are building this on uh, Plone and Python and Zope. And uh, it's going to be going production in February. And we're going to release it in GPL in March. And what I'm hoping to get is that ecosystem going, where it's going to be out there in the open. But I think it would be. Uh, uh, impractical to believe that localities will just say, wow, look, free e-government. Uh, let me go and download it and put it in production by myself. It's not going to work because it's complex technology. It took my organization a good two years to become comfortable with all of the pieces. I cannot imagine somebody else saying, wow, this is just so great. I'm willing to invest two years in let me build my own skills up. I think what much, much rather should happen is that there are vendors out there that say, for a fixed price, I'm gonna provide this software to you as a service. And not to me, because I'm already running with it, I, I, I have my skills, my, my needs are met now, but all these others who want to use the same thing. And say, maybe it takes two weeks, four weeks, I change Newport News to Portland, to Seattle, and uh, I provide the service and runs on my servers, and it costs you $20,000 to get going. And then you need enhancements, you need features, you need uh, more work in, in year two and year three, 
you know, I'll give that to you on a time and material basis or contract basis or whatever basis you want to you, you, you want to grow your business from that point. But again, back to the ecosystem, it would work for me because I, you know, what, what I mean, the reason I'm giving it away is I want to see it very successful. I want to see 20, 30, 40, 100 installations running, uh, all of this uh, uh, governments uh, enhancing it, creating value, and I want that value back. It works for the vendors like Signex and many others that want to be part of this if you want to provide that service. But the thing is that uh, up front, you need to provide a, uh, you need to think it through of how do you provide that service so that it's not a uh, big barrier to entry to, to a new government that might, might want to use it. In other words, it needs to be attractive, right? Uh, $20,000, uh, $10,000 and in two weeks and you're up and running and I change a few things and your users now add content and you're up, you're up. I provide the service. You don't have to install anything. I provide the service at whatever X dollars a month. That's basically what I'm looking for. So the leverage buy, we, we talked about leverage buy a, a lot, this Texas uh, loss in the ERP. There's also the Connecticut Learning Management System. So if uh, any of you in Oregon State University do uh, distance learning, then you can talk to the Connecticut folks who have implemented a shared um, distribution and implementation it's offered as on-demand software by the NGO of learning management software. And every university in Connecticut benefits from it. It works for the NGO, it works for the vendor. It's a, it's a, it's a win-win all the, all the way around. Uh, give him another CD, I don't. <laughs> I don't, I don't recall, I'm sorry. I'm not in the universities. Don't know, do not know who the vendor is. Okay, but, but, the answer is here. Because if you really want to know who the vendor is, you want to know any, um, any other information, I'm giving you here some good links on the web to look these things up. So whichever uh, uh, initiative here interests you, that's where you go to find out more information. So for Connecticut, is line number two, okay? Okay, so back to this. This is the end of my presentation and the final slide I'm going to leave up through the Q&A. As you recall now, uh, it's a very much similar model to Brian's, but uh, a little expanded to, impl to include implementation and services. And now it's your turn to ask questions, and uh, we have more CDs, and uh, go ahead. So on the Texas uh, Lawson example, um, I assume that the vendor is still making all the software changes. It's not really an open source community. It's it's really a different model, and you know it sounds very similar to typical models you have today, where a bunch of users you know have the same software system, and then they have a user group, and the vendor um, prioritizes the changes they're going to make based on what the user group wants. So how how does that model differ? But it doesn't differ much except in the fact that, um, yeah, it's a, it's a vendor proprietary software. So from a software perspective, there's no difference. From an implementation perspective, there's a world of difference. Because if I was to join the collaborative, then I'm going to get all their best practices, all the deliverables from the initial loss and engagement with those three localities. I get that as a starting point. And they, I'm not charged for that. And now I'm only charged for going on from here, let's make it Virginia specific. So indeed, from a software perspective, no difference. From an implementation perspective, a world of difference. I'm hoping to, if I'm gonna do this, to slash my implementation cost in half maybe, okay? And then I'm also looking forward to shared services because I don't wanna have to run this in my, uh, my own data center. I would like to just pay for that and patches and versioning and all that be done by the experts. I'm not the expert at Lawson, I don't, I don't wanna be. Okay, thank you. Um, did, did Lawson just recently figure this out? Because it, didn't they just join an open source group this month? So I mean, this is kind of like something they're kind of backing their way into. I'm not really sure when they figured this out. I know that I found them about four weeks ago that they, they were doing this by posting a general statement that I want to do something like this in ERP. And 
if it's a good idea, I'm sure somebody has thought about it before, or else if nobody thought about it, it must be a bad idea. So I posted it out there on an open forum. Uh, Hansen responded first, and it was the CEO of Hansen, Chuck Hansen, but he missed my point completely that I'm trying to form a collaborative, and he basically wanted to push his product and why Hansen is better than all the others. And I came back to him, I said, I appreciate your response, thank you very much, but really I'm trying to form a collaborative here. No, I don't care about your product versus the other products. He didn't respond. But part of those conversations, I discovered that Lawson is doing it. So exactly how this happened, I don't know. What I do know is that Lawson has about eight examples of this. This is the one that's closest to what we do. The other seven are more schools, K through 12 related. And I don't have any state examples. Mm -hmm. So clearly they're interested in this, they understand the model, and they're ready to go forward. Yeah, okay. Any more questions? Yeah, back there. Andy, could you uh, describe the uh, points that this model reduces the risk compared to a non-collaborative solution? What a great question, the reducing of the risk. Uh, the gentleman who runs the Connecticut Collaborative, his name is Ed Klonowski. He wrote a great article about this, and I read it, and I'm trying to recall now the words he used. Um, Um, can, can recall. The, the reducing of the risk is the fact that um, I'm not starting from scratch. I'm starting with a working model that I'm trying to tweak as little as possible to make it work for me. The, le the least amount of changes you would make to a working system, right? Uh, and I'm, I'm saying that with, with whether it's, it's an ERP, then it's a configuration. You know, it's a high risk that you, you create a configuration of, of something that doesn't work at the, at the end, right? So if you start with something that is working, much like in software, the least amount of changes you make, the better, right? So that's one way of reducing the risk. Another way of reducing the risk is, why Lawson? You know, somebody had to make a decision on its Lawson, should it be, you know, what, what fits better local government? Lawson, SAP, or Oracle, or PeopleSoft, or all the others. Somebody went through that process and, and picked Lawson. Uh, most likely, if Lawson is the wrong choice, um, I'm less at fault than if I would have picked Lawson. So that's another example of, of you know, risk is shared, okay? Plausible deniability. That's what Ed Kronowski called it. Plausible deniability. <laughs> it's plausible that, you know, I didn't know that Lawson was not so good. Comments, questions? Yeah. So one of the challenges that I'm trying to struggle with is it looks like as we reduce the price of the software, over time we're increasing the dependency, we're increasing the potential price to the services that are associated with the software. What's the impact of the licensing and the various types of licensing both on the price of the software, the price of the services, and the obligations to give back? Are you talking about the different licensing schemes in open Dif source? Different licensing schemes in open source and their impact on both the services and on the product. Well, I don't think I'm going to have a great answer. You know what? Uh, do we still have the expert here, Ward? Do you, do you have some thoughts about that? Uh, Why don't you think a little, yeah? I'm trying to process that. Okay, okay, think, think a little bit, and I'm, I'm going to tell you a couple. Look. I, so you said that you used a GPL license. Yeah. How did you come to that decision as it relates to the price of the software and the price of the services that will be propagated? Well, well first of all, I'm, I did not look at it as price of software or services. Software will not have a price. I don't think it matters what model we use. In, in my, this particular example of the e-government, we we're giving it away. The software will not have a price. There's going to, not going to be a software license fee. There's going to be a, some sort of a maintenance fee because you have to keep it up. So when I look at picking a license, I don't, I, did, I don't think about this cost you're talking about. I'm more thinking about 
what would be the license that meets my goal? And my goal is to make sure that the license itself is not a deterrent from other organizations using my software. That's one important goal because I want it to propagate. Okay? So I want a license that is approved, sort of. You know, I don't want to come up with a Newport News version of the license that everybody will doubt. What is this? And now I have my legal involved. GPL, LGPL is more accepted as it's okay. We're using a lot of GPL and LGPL as it is. It's okay. Okay? The other, the other part is, you know, do I, you know, some licenses are more restrictive in terms of, you know, everything you build on top of it, you know, they're viral. So some are more viral than others. Now this has an impact then on the vendor community that I did not really think through to say, uh, what I really want to encourage is that, that the software grows and value is added to them and, and vendors and governments are eagerly adding value to this software. Uh, certain licenses are more restrictive in terms of what kind of a license you, you end up with after you add value to it and others are more liberal. So that's basically where my thinking is, is do I want to restrict, do I not want to restrict? What I really want is to propagate and I want to get that value back. But I don't see a necessarily a direct correlation between licensing and cost. But maybe Ward, now that he thought about it, he does. Hold, hold for the microphone, Ward. We, we want to hear your words. Well, certainly uh, uh, the, the debate whether you want a viral or a non-viral license uh, is, is, is something that we engage in, you know, as to whether that encourages or discourages uh, the growth of ecosystems. Uh, I, I think, though, that uh, one thing that we, we, we like to think about, and, and, and here I'm going to draw from an analogy from, uh, uh, not from software development, from, but from the, the, the wiki experience, is that people really value what they called a uh, signal to noise ratio, that there was a lot of good content, not just a lot of content. And that required a restraint on the part of, of the authors, that the authors didn't put a lot of junk in there. And I think there's a, you know, a tradition in software development, maybe it's by selling based on long feature lists, to put a lot of junk in software, and that, uh, uh, Tackling that problem of how to how to go slow and wait for the really good idea instead of just reacting to the first thing that comes to mind is really important and and I don't think we have a perfect solution to that yet, but that's where uh, that's where a long term cost savings is going to come from from having clean and simple software, not from uh, getting lots of software cheaper. Well, what a great thing to have the inventor of Wiki on your, uh, Wiki on your side to answer tough questions like this. Thanks, Ward. Other thoughts, questions? We have more CDs to give away. Yes. Andy, I was thinking about your, uh, the e-government P thing you have there. And it, it, we've been going through some similar thoughts that is, we built, although ours was not was built with some proprietary technologies that it, for various reasons it was built on a cold fusion base sitting on top of a Java server now. Um, but very, very extensive um, government focused web content management system with a lot of um, capabilities as I travel around the country I've yet to see in other sites. But the question is, I mean, we've developed it. It's a complete thing right now. And how do you take it out and create a community? Is there a way to create a community around it? I've had other people come and ask us whether we would license it, whether we would share it. Um, and we're, we're pretty willing to entertain that. But there's a big step from doing that to establishing a community. Now, in the past, uh, we took some things we developed and as we were getting requests for them, we weren't in a position to try to support other users. So we actually did an RFP for somebody uh, as a vendor to come in and pick it, license it from us who would then do sort of resale and support. And that was in a, a rev potential revenue genera generating model 
which I'm less concerned about now and would much rather go this direction, but that issue of how do you get something so you don't end up being the support entity for it, which we can't possibly do today, and take something that we know has value, we know people have, people have seen it, like it, and keep asking us whether there's a way to make it move forward. So, but that next step is a tough one and, and hard to de devote resources to. Great. Ward, think about this because I'm going to come back to you, okay? Because you're the expert here. But I'll tell you my, my brief answer, okay? Because since I have the microphone, I, I have the right to the first answer. Um, I, I come back to the... Yeah. <laughs> I come back to this. I'm going to need to, to select an NGO for the ro rollout of my government anyway. I haven't thought it through yet. Would it be National League of Cities? Would it be National Association of Counties? Where do I go as an NGO to do what I need done for my government? Now, you could do the same to say, once, once we picked it, let's, let's work together on that to say, let's pick the same NGO and say, let the NGO offer two solutions. Here is a cold fusion one, and here is a open source clones or Python one. And this has some advantages, and this has, has some advantages. That might be one model. Ward, do you have a better idea? Um, I, I, I would say that I think there are, are some excellent pieces of software that are, that are not well organized for community development. And uh, if, if community development isn't, you know, kind of, you know, in the mind of the original architects, it can be hard to, to get the community involved. And mostly it's because it's hard to find a place to get started. You know, you, you, know, you, you find that everything you want to do as a new developer, you know, leads to another thing and another thing and another thing. You just wish you were there in the beginning.